Hello, um, welcome to Partners in Confinement, the final installment of the Marin Poetry Center series um, that's sponsored in part with the Mill Valley Library. I'm Amanda Moore. I'm the chair of events for the Marin Poetry Center. And before we start tonight, I wanted to tell you about some upcoming Marin Poetry Center events. On November 14th, we'll have the second meeting of our Bridges to Poetry book club. Our first meeting was to discuss John Murillo's contemporary American poetry. Um, and next month we'll be uh, reading Natalie Diaz's post-colonial love poem. We hope you'll join us. On November 19th, uh, the, in partnership with the Marin JCC, we'll be hosting a reading with Meryl Natchez and Jane Hirschfield. And in December, we'll have our annual anthology launch and another meeting of the Bridges to Poetry Book Club, which will feature Thea Matthews' book, Unearth the Flowers. Information on all of these events is available on our website where you can also become a member. Um, I'd like to thank actually the members of the Marin Poetry Center who support events like this and the Mill Valley Library without whom we would not have this lovely environment to host our readings. Uh, when we're in person, they give us a physical space and here online, they give us a home on Zoom. So thank you to the Mill Valley Library. During tonight's event, I hope you'll notice that there's a Q&A box where you can ask some questions. As part of the conversation, I'll try to weave those in. Um, but before we start with questions, I'd like to just introduce our guests and welcome them. We are so lucky to have Patricia Smith and Bruce Tisilva with us. Patricia Smith is the author of eight books of poetry, including Blood Dazzler and Incendiary Art, which won the 2018 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, the 2017 Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and the 2018 NAACP Image Award, was also a finalist for the 2008 Pulitzer Prize. This is not the last time you will hear the word Pulitzer as I um, introduce these guests. She's a Guggenheim Fellow a Civitellian, a National Endowments for the Arts grant recipient, a finalist for the Neustadt Prize, a two-time winner of the Pushcart Prize, a former fellow at both Yaddo and the McDowell Colony, and a four-time individual champion of the National Poetry Slam, the most successful poet in the competition's history. She's a distinguished professor for the City University of New York and an instructor in the MFA program at Sierra Nevada University and in the Vermont College of Fine Arts postgraduate residency program. And with her tonight is Bruce De Silva. Bruce De Silva's crime fiction has won the Edgar and McCavity Awards. It's been listed as a finalist for the Seamus Anthony and Barry Awards and has been published in 10 foreign languages. His short stories have appeared in the Akashic Press's award-winning noir anthologies. He's reviewed books all over the place, including for the New York Times Sunday Book Review and Publishers Weekly. And his reviews for the Associated Press have appeared in hundreds of other pub publications. Previously, he was a journalist for 40 years, most recently as a writing coach worldwide for the Associated Press editing stories that won nearly every major journalism prize, including the Pulitzer. He has worked as a consultant for 50 newspapers, taught at the University of Michigan and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and lectured at Harvard University's Neiman Foundation. So welcome to Patricia and Bruce. I thought I would start us off tonight um, because this is about partnerships in this time of quarantine and confinement and ask you both what this time for you and your dogs. I forgot to mention the dogs. There are two yeah. there's, gorgeous. There's, one, there's a dog who's waiting for my granddaughter to get home and she's almost home and he's going to be, he misses her so much. So we'll talk loud enough so you don't hear him hopefully. But Should we talk. introduce the dogs? Is uh, Rondo is one? No. Rondo was the one who just came up and kissed our nose. Uh, Brady is the elderly gentleman. He's 11 years old, and he is the one who's kind of stuck in his ways and is going to bark until he gets what he wants, which is probably about five minutes away. All right. Well, in those five minutes, um, I'd love to just ask you what this time has been like for you both as writers, as we're home more, compressed more. Um, how has this landed with you? Um, it's been great for me. I, I figured out I really like my home. 
uh, I figured out that I, I like the guy I married. <laughs> You know, because sometimes it doesn't work out that way. You know, you're home and you go, what the hell did I do? Um, but I travel a lot. And, uh, and so this is the longest I've been home in years. You know, um, I'm usually home probably about three or four days or at the most a week. Uh, when I am teaching, I'm sort of fitting my travel time around my teaching. And every once in a while, I would ask Bruce, I'd say, is this okay with you that I'm gone so much, you know? And and uh, he would say, well, no, it's it's your time. It's your time to be doing this, you know? And so I'll take care of things and you go ahead and you go. So it was taking a chance to just kind of be home all the time and go, oh, let's look at this guy that I married and see if I, you know, if he's a keeper or not. Um, so that's worked out. I, I actually... Um, you know, I live close, we live close to New York, uh, but I am, I'm kind of a homebody. I'm a cancer, you know, uh, and so now what I'm doing, oh, I think the person who's coming is driving in. So uh, now what I'm doing is uh, I'm kind of redoing the house and making it a little bit more, you know, homey. We both have, uh, you know, big offices. And so they're right across from each other. We used to have the same office, but now um, I have my own. Uh, and so we can always retreat to our offices. Um, I, what we usually do is work during the day. I think I work a little bit more because I'm still teaching, Bruce is retired. Um, and then uh, come together, you know, in the evenings. That sounds dirty, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, gather, gather in the evenings. And, um, you know, commune then. And it's, it's been working out fine. It's, it's getting a little, I'm the social director for the family. So I'm, I'm the one who just goes and buys the Broadway tickets and does things. And, and I, I kind of miss that. Uh, I miss, you know, concerts and surprises, things like that. You know, Bruce, you know, he won't do it. You know, he doesn't think about it but I do it and he has this great time, you know, so I missed that and I'm talking a whole lot and you're not talking. So go right ahead. How's this well, been I, for you? I, I like it because you were usually on the road so much that you were gone about half the year. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be home. And yeah, this is the longest that you have been home and we've been together uh, almost since we started. Uh, which is 17 years today, by the way. This is our wedding anniversary today. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Look at the man. Happy it's anniversary! Like, and this is how we're celebrating: is <laughs> talking to you on Zoom. Our PayPal is. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, where are you registered for anniversary gifts? <laughs> well, congratulations! It's it's Thank an amazing you. achievement to have in the anniversary, but especially right now when we're together so much to be so happy and sitting so close to one another. <laughs> I'm glad we can be, I hope you're, you're gonna have some champagne when this is over. We're glued actually, cause I didn't want to have anything <laughs> to do with them. And we, right. we, have, we have started already. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you have offices right across from one another. Do you read each other's work in progress? What's your relationship to one another as writers? Um, it, it, it's, uh, unconventional, I think, in a lot of ways. For one thing, yeah, we read each other's work in progress, uh, uh, not as much as we used to, uh, but, uh, we do, and we never fight about it. We never argue. We can criticize each other's work, and it's always taken, uh, taken well. Um, I, I think one of the, yeah, it is, and I, I think one of the, one of the most unusual things about the way it works is that, um, uh, although I'm a fiction writer and she's a poet, which should mean that I'm more long winded, uh, and that, and that she, her writing is tighter. It tends to work the other way around when I edit her work. Uh, I, much of what I suggest is cut. And early on in our relationship, uh, it often was, uh, you know, she would give me a poem and I would cross out the first stanza or two. 
and say that's throat clearing, the poem actually begins down here. Uh, there's less of that now, right? Uh, because you don't, you, you kind of learned that lesson and you don't do that much anymore. Uh, and otherwise, it sounds uh, funny. You learned that lesson. You did. Yeah. You've got very, very good at not doing that, of getting right to the point early on. And um, uh, so I tend to, much of what I suggest still is, is trims and cuts and, and sharpenings. Uh, when she edits my work, she tends to want to make it longer. Uh, my writing uh, as a crime novelist tends to be very spare. Uh, and uh, to the point of, of, of sensory deprivation and Patricia will look at it and go, you should say more about this. You should describe this person a little more. You should give me more of a sense of place here. Uh, and so she, you know, when she edits my work, it tends to expand. The other main thing she does though is um, uh, there are times in my novels where I need to write a love scene and I am always baffled by what to do. He can't, he can't, I, he can't, it's like, okay, <laughs> I, I have these two people, mm -hmm. this man, this woman, here's where they are now. Here's where I need them to be, you know, usually in bed or something. <laughs> How do I get them? From point A to point B, what is he saying? Is she believing it? What is she wearing? Does she smell good? Blah, 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 blah. You know, because he's writing this chopped kind of detective stuff, you know. Hello, sleep with me. Okay, no, you know, no, that no. kind of... <laughs> that, <laughs> but, you know, he's like, okay, so she's doing this. How is he reacting? Or he's doing that and how is she... So um, I can always tell. It was like... I, when our when our offices were uh, in the same place, he'd get real quiet, and then he'd go, Patricia, <laughs> Patricia. Um, and it was either a, a, a love scene. The, the hard thing was um, I, I'm very descriptive. Uh, you know, I love narrative poems, and I love, I love lush writing and stuff. So sometimes I want to put too much into his, you can't really have a police procedural with all this, you know, all the rolling meadows and all this stuff, you know. So I'm trying to do that. And um, he, what he says that he sees my poems and he exits the first part out because I got started by getting up on stage and doing my poems. There was initially a lot of throat clearing. There was a lot of scene setting because the people didn't have a book to take home and they only had those three minutes to hear the poem and I couldn't repeat it. So there was a lot of walking them in through the poem. And so the, the transition from doing spoken word to being mostly on the page was a lot of that, you don't need this, you don't need yeah. this, you don't need this. There's a, there's a poem in, in, I think your first book about Little Richard, the, the- Second book. Rock and Roller. Yeah, second book. And uh, when she did it on stage, and then when it uh, was in the first book, it began with little Richard walking out onto a stage at the, at the Tonight Show, I think, with Johnny Carson. And he sits down in the couch. And so there's like a stanza of that scene setting. And then the next stanza begins, I am the architect of rock and roll. It's like, okay, that's where that poem starts. Okay, first of right all, there. I'm not old enough to remember Johnny Carson. <laughs> um, so... It was it was Arsenio Hall. Okay. It was Arsenio Hall. Um, that that's what I uh, it's kind of what I really enjoyed because um, Bruce introduced me to the whole world of crime fiction, which I didn't know anything about. I went to conferences with him. It's an amazing, giving, wonderfully accepting community. Yeah. You know, um, and and I have my favorite writers. Uh, it was a little harder, I think, to pull him into the poetry community. And I, I, this, let me tell you why. Okay. <laughs> Poets are very touchy-feely. Okay. We're always like, oh, it's so good to see you. You know. And so he comes the first time. He's like, what in, what is this? Who is this guy picking you up off the ground and whirling <laughs> you around and all, you know, all this and, and there was a really kind of tense moment where I said, well, I'm not going to change the way I behave with my friends, but you have to understand these are my friends, you know? So his entry into the poetry community, which was mostly 
visual and not on the page, at least at the beginning, was a yeah, little harder was. than my interest entrance into the mm -hmm. crime fiction community. The crime fiction community is uh, amazingly supportive and not all writing communities are like that. Mm. Uh, it's uh, the, the, the people are uh, helpful and welcoming and can't do enough for you. And in fact, Patricia knows that firsthand because she won a big crime fiction writing award at the, at the Edgar Awards what, five <laughs> years ago. See, I like <laughs> challenges, right? So I would go to these things. I went to this, this convention or whatever, and they had a panel and it was on crime in New York. So I teach at the College of Staten Island. So they had Queens and the Bronx and Brooklyn and Manhattan and no Staten Island. And I have this problem with my students who all want to get out of Staten Island as soon as possible, right? They, they don't like where they live. They, you know, and I'm sitting there going, excuse me, there's crime in Staten Island too, you know? Uh, and so afterwards, uh, the woman who was doing the Brooklyn book, who happened to be a, a, a great, uh, it was S.J., S.J. Yes, Rosen, Rosen. Uh, a great crime fiction person, went to the people at Akashic. Uh, they published those um, noir books, mm -hmm. like, you know, like Brooklyn Noir. And, you know, so all of the stories in the book have to be from that particular area. And, and they said, there was this woman and she was, you know, and uh, Johnny Temple at Ak Akashic, Akashic, Akashic knew me as a poet. And so there was this whole thing like, can a poet edit a fiction book? I don't know. Let's say, you know, I had to be vetted. You know, it was so funny. Like we're not all writing. But but they wanted you because they couldn't find anybody to edit the Staten Island book. They want whoever's going to edit the book and people who's going to write for it to be to have a connection to that place. And it's Staten Island. I mean, it's not the easiest place in the world to find people who read, let them mind, never mind people who write. <laughs> He's the, he doesn't mean oh, that. No. My, oh, all, no. my students, oh, no. all my students who are watching, he doesn't mean that. It's not uh, a particularly literary place. So, well, yeah. Yeah. So, it makes sense then that, that they would choose you. And it, it sounds to me because you have this, this ear for narrative anyway, and you were saying that your poems tended to be narrative. Of course. Yeah. You'd be was, great at editing that. It was hard. It was hard to find people. I'm gonna tell my Colin Joe story in a minute. Wait, 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 wait. So it's hard to find people, but then they saved the, they saved one part of the book and they said you can write a story and I had never written a story before so I wrote a story um and you know gotten I love this and then I get this email that says your story has been chosen the best debut story for by, from the mystery writers of America and I said Bruce mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but my other stat now story really quickly is I was getting these writers together and Colin Jost from Saturday Night Live is from Staten Island. So I call him and I say, I got this anthology. And he's like, oh, that's fantastic. I'm going to write this great story. And, and, and. and then he stops answering my calls. You know how when you say you're going to do something, when you want to write something, and then you're not able to do it and instead of just saying you can't do it, you just avoid the editor? So totally. that's what he did. So every time when Saturday Night Live comes on, when his picture shows up, I say, I hate Colin Jobs. That's all. That's all I got to say about him. Because he missed out on his opportunity he to be out. All I could have made, made him famous. Instead, look, he's marrying Scarlett Johansson. The other part but not story, recognized though. by an award-winning <laughs> mystery writer. So uh, Bruce, The other part of the story is that after uh, she won that award, the... the uh, the story was selected by Otto Penzler for his annual Best Mystery Stories anthology. And Otto called it a distinguished piece of American literature. <laughs> he did. In all genres. In Can all you genres. imagine, Amanda, a distinguished piece of American literature? Something yeah. I wrote. Can you imagine first, that? First I can. story you never wrote, so yeah. it pissed me off. So, Bruce, have you made any forays into the poetry world? Then? <laughs> have you written any poems? Uh, no. <laughs> No, uh, I, I, I don't uh, even, <laughs> don't, don't even, I can't do any of my limericks. Uh -oh. no, uh -oh. <laughs> um, do you read other poets other than Patricia? Nope. Not as a rule. Occasionally she will give me something and say, you must read this. 
Uh, and uh, as, a, as someone who's both a mystery writer and who spent 40 years in journalism, uh, uh, I am uh, I'm very literal. And so no anything that is very abstract, anything that has lots of symbolism, I don't appreciate it. I don't enjoy it. If it's hard to read, I don't like it. If I have to struggle to understand it, I don't like it. Everything about what I was taught as a journalist and, and continue to practice as a, as a fiction writer is writing that, that needs to be studied to under, be understood is not good. That writing should be transparent, clear, easily understood. And so that means that an awful lot of poetry is both inaccessible and uninteresting to me. Patricia's poetry, on the other hand, one of the great charms about it is that it is ex it, it's both beautiful and extremely accessible. Anyone can pick it up and understand what she has to say. And when I, I asked if you I had practiced that all day, saying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. when I asked if you would read us a poem of hers, you you said that you didn't want to do that. You don't want to read. No, her I poems think that if, if somebody's going to read one of her poems, she should do it because she is a brilliant performer of her own work. But it would be it, nice it, to see what you brought to you. Know. <laughs> <laughs> you have favorite poets though, right? Uh, other than you? Not really. You like Carolyn? I do like Carolyn Porsche. You like That's Ellen. True. You like Ellen, but you're not Ellen sure. Bass. Yeah, you like Ellen yeah, Bass. Bass. Kind of. You like Terrence Hayes. Uh, uh, Tayamba Jess. You had Tayamba Jess. See, he knows poets. Look at this. And I like the way Tayamba dresses. He's a very, very cool dresser. <laughs> so you like being in the world as much as you like their work. Uh, I like a lot of the people in that yeah. world. It makes oh, sense right. to me what you were saying about your world, though, the crime writing world being very supportive and embracing Patricia, because that's sort of her role in the poetry world. I don't, I'm mm -hmm. sure you already know that, but she is the welcoming force, the, yes. the person who invites everyone to the table. So it makes sense, I think, that your worlds are connected in that way. Well, he's um, the, the crime writing that I'm mostly um drawn to is is just the same type i mean it's it has heavy poetic elements you know james and so lee burke. james lee burke is a i mean mm -hmm. so amazing that i would just read you know and i didn't know that that kind of writing was being done in in crime fiction you know and so once i did i said okay if i like him who else am i going to like and then I also started to like the, the, the sort of breakneck speed things like Ch Lee Child writes, you know. Um, so it, the thing is, if you are interested in writing, if you're a poet, a crime fiction writer, whatever, you're a storyteller. And once I, I start thinking of myself as a storyteller, those lines that, those heavy lines between the genres just start to melt away. And, you know, I've started to see novels in verse. I've started to see crime stories in verse. Uh, and, and so we, and we thought about, I think we're still thinking about writing a book together. Um, mm -hmm. He's got that, uh, we're gonna take advantage of the fact that he's got that clipped kind of, what, who, was the, who was the guy the, the, on television? The, 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 the dragnet, who was that? Oh, uh, Joe Friday? Yeah, Joe Friday. See, he sounds like Joe Friday when he writes well, it. Well, not quite, but. Well, you know, sometimes. It's just, it's just get right to the point. And we wanted to do a, a novel in alternating voices. We, we were talking about doing something. I talk a lot about mm -hmm. Chicago and I grew up on the west side of Chicago and that's the part of town everybody tells you to stay away from. And one of the things that, I remember before the riots in 1968 uh, that burned down almost all of my neighborhood. Uh, there was a cop who, who walked the beat mm -hmm. and he would go into the beauty salons and the stores and everybody knew him and it was a white cop. And um, at, he would go into the salon and there was this woman who did hair there, this black woman and she would get all flustered and she, you know, and I, and I thought about that for a long time. And so I, I wanted to write something and have him do kind of the cop voice and, and have me do the, you know, the woman in the neighborhood voice. Uh, and I think we still might do it. 
Uh, that's one I'm good ready. thing about the pandemic. See, yeah, he's ready. I'm, I'm ready. teaching. <laughs> um, and I have a book in the transom now. I have a book that's already finished and stuff. So it, it clears up my space to do work on something this year. Oh, that's exciting. I hope Thanksgiving then, since none of us will be tra traveling anywhere, you can get started. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I'm giving you homework. I should, just, <laughs> I should just get on in on the November novel writing thing. Is it oh. November, write a novel in November? Oh, just yeah, just take a month and write a book. <laughs> yeah, just every day, thousands yeah. of words. There are, come there are people out. who do that. Well, I would love if you would share some work. I know you're not going to read each other's, but um, if you could maybe share a little piece that you've worked on during this time or that you'd like to share with us. Oh, that we've worked on through this time. Or, or no, no, anytime. Whatever oh, work you feel like reading. You know what, though? Uh, I can do that. I can, I can, oh, okay. <laughs> See, because I have my books, but then if I call up something that I've worked on during this time, it'll cover. Yeah, it will cover the screen. You don't want to do that. I can, well, I yeah, can do that. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Wait, bring, bring from Lynn Thompson, prepare. from my best friend, Lynn Thompson, read the poem in Lit Hub. Uh, it's too long. How much time do we have, Amanda? Oh, uh, we should wrap up in 20 minutes, but we have plenty oh, of time okay. and we want to get to Q&A's. We have plenty of time. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try and do this. We're going to make you smaller. Oh, okay. There you are. Okay. And I'm going to do this. Lynn, you're just a pain. You are <laughs> such a pain. All right. And then I'm going to do this. Oh, no, that's that. That's my Google Docs. <laughs> Never mind. No, I didn't want to do that. I want to call up this poem. There it is. Okay. So we okay? We ready? Yeah, hit us with it. Okay, I'll read it. Uh, I wrote this for John Freeman uh, from Lit Hub, and he asked me to write a letter that people were writing a letter to kind of reflect the time. And um, I didn't I started the letter and this is what came out. It's called Salutations in Search of long. One, dear floaters, bloated kin, dear flooded necks and reckless leapers manic for the flow. Though you are elegant in flight, your wrecks distress the ocean's floor. The stark tableaus of sliding skin and swarms of slither set to drumbeat in your hollows. This is free proclaimed by slavers scourge. Do you regret rebutting scar with water? Dear debris, the ocean mothers all your rampant funk and spurts her undulating arms for you. She likes to think that you are simply drunk with purpose. Dear, the voyage never knew your name. You rise in pieces, love to death, at last unshackled. Time will hold your breath. Dear wild tumultuous, your mouth, dear God, your mouth in fevered skirmish with the tongue, denying sound for rope or goldenrod. Dear mouth, still bulging with Atlantic, wrung into its new, your tangled words are lashed into the back, intending to explain the gritted teeth inspected for a flash of rot, the hefted cock or breast, a chain that that's wrenched away, the clinging shreds of skin. Dear going to market, beauty on the block, sea driven deep, dear chartered womb, within you squirms a tendency, a paradox. You trusted voyage, trust to kin, and found your tongue through tumult. Now you need a sound. Dear mute contrivance, graceless drudge, dear hexed, dear wily roots and conjures, dear persist with your existence. Flaunting all that flexed and bumptious brawn, dear flagrantly dismissed, the writhing in the cottonwood, dear flail and drip, dear runaway who runs the hell away, dear prey for drooling cur, dear veil of Judas moon, its murmured decibel of light, dear cautious measurer of splay and fury in a heatless star, dear we. Dear woman who must now learn to unsay her purpose as a mute machine. Dear bee that's soft alive. Dear man whose fevered drum was lost at sea. What nouns will you become? Dear lurch and pirouette. Dear flamed facade. Dear eye that won't dissolve. Your audience obsessed with shrinkage. Fancies to applaud and whoop. But damn that eye and the suspense and dogged smolder of its wide aloud. 
identified, of course, and doomed to swing, you vow to witness. Your enraptured crowd, delighting in your new scene as a thing to do, do not wish to be seen by you. Dear languid rumba, freakish scorch and sway, dear blackened reckoning, dear charred askew, dear stuff of nightmares seeping into day, the fire has died, there's nothing of you there, but they still see the fiction of your glare. Dear Langston, Zora, Louis, Josephine, dear Harlem, their rampaging stanzas, still explosive whether they are sugar lean pronouncements from a horn, the thrill of stories touting faces like the ones who hallelujah every time they read themselves, or not to be outdone, a pure astonishment of women. Need this nurture and this verb on dimming days. Dear, give you back your name. Dear, higher ground. Dear, noontime strutter, balancing pez nays and being Negro all upside that town. Dear, swinger to a thicker harmony. Dear, everyone they said you couldn't be. Dear migrant on a greyhound, stunned upright, or crammed into a wheezing Plymouth, or bewildered by the rails soon to ignite beneath your seat. Dear locked and shuttered door with you on both the sides. Dear bound to be more partial to the heat. Folks say the chill in old Chicago knows your bones. The key is birthing your own son and clutching till it walks with you. Dear you, already done surrendering magnolias, feigning shame at chitlins, holding that amusing gun to your own truant heart. Dear faultless aim, dear northern body scrubs at what it must, dear wily scarlet slap of southern dust. Dear edgy citizen, dear crazed Kareen through multitudes of all the same as you, your skittish eyes outstretch, dear seen, and then as if on cue, unseen, you knew enough to heed the itchy siren song that cooed you through the rusty yawning maws of factories, dear often in the wrong direction, dear Chicago digs its claws in you, the rank air gorgeous with disease and pay stubs, Mayor Daly's startling swell, his pocked and blustered face and odd reprise of those you thought you left behind, dear bell that keeps on ringing, blues that hit their mark and make you dance all righteous in the dark, dear a nigger in all moors of light, dear bullseye, Trees rise up on spindly toes whenever you, your skin strolls by. Dear, quite mistake of you, the way you dare expose your neck and walk as if you own a thing. Dear, blue on you, and don't you wish there was a ship, one chance to take a frenzied wing into the ocean? Nothing but the buzz of flashers pinning you against the past. Dear suicide, dear bullet in the back, dear in the headlights, you're not tagged to last until the morning. You are tagged to crack beneath their weight, and don't you dare believe that any one of them will let you breathe. Dear George, Trayvon, Brianna, Bree Tamir, Alashiana, Dominique, Jamel, Antonio, D'Angelo, Romere, Ashante, Botham, Terrence, John, Chanel, Stefan, Falando, Kentry, B, Leilene, Romello, Emmett, Eleanor, Monte, Janissa, Kiki, Alte, Mac, Francine, Tanisha, Eric, Dominic, Renee, Michelle, Elijah, Nia, Amadou, Akai, Monina, Cart, Cortez, Kentry, Sean, Alberta, Michael, Gabriella, Lou, Natasha, Brooklyn, Walter Lee, Laquan, Ahmad, Mohammed, Elray, Aura, Shane, Roshad, Denali, Sandra, Oscar, Blaine. Dear someone who woke up without a son. Dear damn the dawning, echoes of a knock with no boy crouched behind it, nothing done to fix it. Dear reverberating shock, dear someone flailing, ripping at the air, obsessed with resurrecting him, who dares believe the muck of bullet hole and bruise will ever breathe as anything but dead. Dear someone loving body on its way to being only body, just that red and syrupy annoyance, hosed away when street decorum says it's time. Dear damn, dear chalk all washed to none, dear traffic jam. Dear woman wounded by the things you've heard, dear angry all your days, dear vibing wire on top of your head, dear better watch the words you say to white folks, don't make them tired of you, dear wish you'd pinch that nostril down, that nose is half your face, dear talk too loud, dear stay out the sun, you fool around, get blacker than you are, what, you proud to settle for that ordinary man, gonna be too late real soon, dear press those naps, and don't you tell me that you plan on yelling about that Black Matters Lives mess, dear who the hell do 
you think you are? Dear, who the hell do you think you are? Dear, someone who woke up without a sun and spun the blues. The singer moaned so hard the record skipped to save itself. Dear, done so wrong. Dear, frying lettuce in the lard. Dear, wonder could a matchbox hold your clothes? Your child's been scraped up off the boulevard. Since then, ain't seen yourself. Do you suppose some rebel yell can find you, hit you hard? Dear, someone who has chosen just to rust instead of breathe. Here's how they lie to you. Your child will keep on dying and you must keep clicking play to watch him blue and blue until he trends. Then he's a photograph who laughs at you and rips himself in half. I rip another page in half. Dear, dear, and start again. Dear floaters, bloated kin, dear flooded necks. Dear wild tumultuous your mouth, dear God. Dear mute contrivance, graceless drudge, dear hexed. Dear lurch and pirouette, dear flame facade. Dear Langston, Zora, Louis, Josephine. Dear migrant on a greyhound, stunned upright. Dear edgy citizen, dear crazed Kareen. Dear still a nigger in all modes of light. Dear George, Trayvon, Brianna, Brie, Tamir. Dear someone who woke up without a son. Dear woman wounded by the things you hear to anyone who wakes up without the sun. I'm sorry that was so long. That was... Oh, Patricia. And Lynn, thank you for recommending that. But what? <laughs> thank you. What a gift to hear that out loud. <sighs> that was amazing. I'm glad we didn't have Bruce read that. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Bruce, have you have you heard her read that out loud before, Bruce? No. no oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I ha I have heard her read that out loud. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, thank you. That was amazing. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so what do you think, Bruce? Would you like to read something to us after that? Or shall we? Do you, do you want take me to follow breath? that? Do you have time? Yeah. We have more than enough time. Look at this. So a source of vipers. Okay. I would... um, I'll, what I'll read is the opening of this, uh, my fourth book called Scourge of Vipers. Uh, part of it is a uh, dialogue uh, between a couple of characters, one of whom uses curse words as punctuation. So if anyone's going to be offended by that, you should leave now. So here we go. A snake, that's what Mario Zarelli had called me. And now, just an hour later, something was slithering across my cracked kitchen linoleum. It was three feet long with lemon racing stripes twisting the length of its brown body. I watched it slide past the wheezing fridge and veer toward the kitchen table where my bare feet rested on the floor. It raised its head and froze its forked tongue flickering. It had caught my scent. I pushed back from the table, got down on my knees, and studied it. A pretty thing. I flashed out my right hand and pinched it just behind its head. It writhed its body a bullwhip. I was startled by its strength. I carried the snake into the bedroom, opened my footlocker, and used my left hand to empty it, tossing a half dozen New England Patriots and Boston Bruins sweatshirts and a spare blanket into the, onto the bed. Beneath the blanket was a Colt 45 that had once belonged to my grandfather. I tossed that on the bed too. Then I dropped the snake inside, slammed the lid and started thinking about names. Stop it, I told myself. The garter snake was probably an escaped pet, the property of someone else in the tenement building. How else could it have found its way into my second floor apartment? When I had time, I'd ask around, but if no one claimed it, I'd be heading to the pet's door for a cage. I could hear the snake blindly exploring inside the footlocker, its scales rasping as it slid against the wood. I couldn't help myself. I started thinking about names again. Mario leaped to mind, but no, I couldn't call it that. I like garter snakes. If Mario had sneaked it in, it would have been a copperhead or a timber rattler. The trouble with Marty, Mario started a week ago when his great uncle, Dominic Woosh Zerilli, and I got together over Boilermakers at Hopes, the local press hangout, to talk about the future. I was a newspaper reporter, so I didn't have one. Woosh was contemplating retirement. The wife's still nagging me about it, he said. Wants me to sell the house, turn the business over to Mario, and move to Florida. So why don't you? I'm thinking on it. And? And what? And what are you thinking? 
I'm thinking I'm sick to death of fucking snow. I'm thinking the warm weather might be good for my, arthrit my arthritis. I'm thinking that if I move down there, I won't have to listen to Maggie talk about moving down there every fucking night. But, but she's got her heart set on one of them retirement villages in Vero Beach or Boca, Boca Raton. Keep shoving brochures in my face. Look at this, honey, she tells me. They've got maid service, swimming pools, croquet, a golf course, horseshoes, craft room, shuffleboard. And have you ever seen so many flowers? He made a face, the same one I once saw him make when he had absentmindedly stuck the coal end of a lucky strike in his mouth. Sounds nice, I said. Oh, yeah? Then you move down there with her. What's wrong with it? You shitting me? Craft rooms? Croquet? I hate fucking shuffleboard. No way I'm wasting whatever years I got left to, uh, listening to a bunch of wheezers with bum tickers and colostomy bags pass gas and brag about the grandkids that never visit while they wait for the reaper to show up. Jesus Christ, Mulligan. Have you seen them fucking places? They're full of old people. Woosh was a few months short of 80. You don't, don't you dare laugh at me, asshole. I'm not. Yeah, but it's taken some effort. <laughs> he waved the waitress over and ordered us both another round of Bushmill shots with Killian Chasers. Maybe you could compromise, I said. Get yourself a beachfront cottage on Sanibel Island or a luxury condo in Fort Myers. Will the Sox have spring training? I already thought of that. Trouble is, ain't no way I can hand the business over to Mario. Why not? Because he's a fucking moron. Mario, just 26 years old, had already done state time for drunken driving and for using his girlfriend as a tackling dummy. Now he was awaiting trial for kicking the crap out of a transvestite who made the near fatal mistake of slipping out of the stable, Providence's newest gay bar, to smoke a cigarette. But he was Woosh's only living blood relative. The punk had inherited the title two years ago when his father was gunned down at a botched East Providence bank robbery. Mario's grandfather, which was only brother, fell to esophageal cancer back in 1997 while serving a 10 year stretch for fencing stolen goods. Woosh and Maggie did have an adopted daughter, but Lucia, a young mother who performed with a New York City dance troupe was an unlikely candidate take, to take over the bookmaking business. My old friend and his wife never had kids of their own. Wouldn't trust Mario with the business even if Arena gave the thumbs up, Woosh was saying, which there's no way he's fucking gonna. No? He already said. The kid's unreliable, draws too much attention to himself. So what are you gonna do? Find somebody I can trust, he said. And all that much to it, really. Take the bets, pay off the winners, collect from the losers, keep half the profits, wire the, re wire the rest once a month to an account down in the Caymans. Got somebody in mind? Yeah, you. That'll do it. I think. Oh, thank you. Snake. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, they did. Ah. Will, will you um, show us the, the title again so that we, if we need to follow up on these characters? A Scourge of Vipers. All right, it was right. The, the first title of a book uh, that my publisher liked. <laughs> Uh, my first book was titled Rogue Island, and they said, it sounds like a book about pirates. People will think it's about pirates instead of, you know, a, a detective. And I said, well, I could solve this problem for you. Just don't put a guy with a peg leg and a, and a parrot on his shoulder on the cover. Uh, and then they didn't like the second book. Uh, the title of the second book was a Providence Rag. And uh, because Mulligan is a newspaper reporter in Providence, Providence Rag, the newspaper, and so I finally decided with this book that I would give them a title that I knew they would like. Uh, two words there, Scourge and Vipers. We're guaranteed to please the, the publishing marketing department. Man words. Yeah. <laughs> and they're nice and big. Testosterone on that, on that words. Cover. That's right. Yeah. Lovely. Um, I want to remind our audience that we have a Q&A feature. We Ooh, do have time for uh -oh. one or two questions if you want to the type chat? them in there. I'm, I've been looking in the chat. Mostly it's just your fan club, the two of you. You're both getting your oh, it's some excitement. Oh, no, there's Bruce De Silva. Oh, hi, Dee Dee. Dee Dee and Lynn Yeva's here. Hi, Meryl. Meryl's here. 
Meryl's here. She's on it. So Meryl thought of partners in confinement. So we owe her a debt of gratitude. Oh, first they say hi to you, then they start talking to each other. I like it. <laughs> Ellen, no questions? No questions from our audience? Because we know that Patricia and Bruce have an anniversary to celebrate. So we don't want to keep them here too long. <laughs> Any other questions um, that you wish we had? Oh, here, I see some now. How has poetry changed, if at all, your writing, Bruce? Uh, I would say that, that because I'm married to a poet uh, and see some of her work, read some of her work, that it has made my work somewhat uh, more lyrical and more descriptive. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the other way around. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and it, for example, that opening of what I just read with the snake with the yellow racing stripes moving slowly across the floor, left to my own devices earlier before I knew Patricia, he would have seen the snake, grabbed it and thrown it in the footlock. You know, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have moved so slowly. The snake so would not have been so musical. <laughs> <laughs> so musical. And, and with me, I, I am enamored of description and setting and yeah. things like that so i i get hooked into it and i go on and on and on mm -hmm. and uh bruce has always the things that he suggests for books or poems uh are always things that later people will point out and say or oh, really like the way you did this you know and and i had to learn that just because something was taken out of a poem or out of a book or something didn't mean that it stopped existing it just wasn't in that book or poem, you know? So when I got really descriptive and crazy, you know, and so now I'm trying to write more fiction and, um, and I'm letting a lot of that stuff back in. And the thing about description, it's I think in any writing, but certainly in crime fiction and journalism is that you should only describe as much as you need to serve the purpose of the story. And so for example, I once described Providence City Hall uh, as uh, as uh, uh, a Beaux Arts uh, monstrosity that looked like it had been carved out of a pile of chicken shit, and I think I said seagull shit. So and that lyrical. was enough. So, so lyrical. That was enough to convey the sense that I wanted to convey that it was an ugly building, and describing much more about the extent of the ugliness would not have really served the purpose of the story at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You see. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Um, I think one last question that we would like to put, there are a couple different versions of this. I think people are interested in what you're both working on next and when they're coming out. Um, we've heard about this potential collaboration, which I'll be thinking about, but what's actually sort of on the page or at the press or coming out? You wanna go first? Sure. Uh, I haven't, um, I've been writing a lot of book reviews. I haven't uh, written uh, another novel since the fifth one came out, uh, what, maybe three years ago. Uh, I have a mm -hmm. small start on two different books and uh, have not moved uh, very far forward with either of them. Part of the reason for that is I haven't felt that urge to do it and the, uh, lately. And the other reason is that I've got seriously distracted editing a major book. Uh, the book is called First Steps. Uh, it is uh, a, uh, a, non, a nonfiction, uh, popular science book about uh, the current state of knowledge about human evolution. Uh, and it is written by uh, one Jerry. of the most important uh, <laughs> paleoanthropologists in America, uh, a, a professor at Dartmouth College named Jeremy De Silva, my, uh, my youngest son. Lovely. And I spent, uh, I guess, the best part of a year off and on uh, working with him on the editing of the book. Comes out in uh, next April, I think. I, I can say I've been nudging, pushing <laughs> Bruce to do novels because uh, one of the things that's really intriguing to me about the relationship, I love when we're both working on something. You know, there's, there's this kind of tunnel of energy that goes back and forth. 
you know, um, I, I loved when he would stop and just yell over and go, here's where I am, here's what's going on, what do I do when I come over, you know, or I'd say, this poem's not working. Um, th there's a theory that writers can't be married to each other, really. <laughs> this whole series has proven that wrong, but, um, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's a set, so I think sometimes there's competition you know, and, and we don't have that. I mean, he's so, I can't even get him to talk about himself most of the times, you know, people would be inter interviewing him about himself and he'd say, well, my wife, she's one of, you know, so he's like my biggest cheerleader and, and I love that. And so we have, um, we have kind of like this mutual admiration society thing. And so I love it when we're both writing, there's, there's, there's no energy like that energy. Um, I, I've, I have a book in the transom already. We have a huge collection of 19th century photos. Uh, we, we liked going around to like tax sales and flea markets, things like that. And then we started looking for 19th century photos of African-Americans uh, in particular. And when I applied to the Guggenheim, it was that project uh, where I thought I would do um, persona poems, dramatic narratives, uh, and try, try to rebuild lives for some of these pictures. You know, they seem like ghosts to me, and I wanted to say, who are you, who are you? Uh, and I've finished that book, uh, and that one I think now is coming out at the beginning 2022, when the world is right again, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that gives me a whole year to write. And I have some fiction that I have started working on already, but then I'm going to sit down and talk to Bruce again about the, the the dual thing. I think I think the good thing when people ask me about things like writer's block, I think the the cure to writer's block is to be working on like three or four things at once, you know. Uh, so when you hit a wall with one thing, you just go to something else, and you should always be working on a children's book. Always. The thing about a children's book is when you hit that big serious wall with that big serious thing that you're doing, you go to the children's book and you can play with language and you can, you, you know, so reality changes. So even if it's something that never comes out or whatever, you know, just let yourself have that moment where you can, you can cut loose in that, you know? And so I've got all these things kind of balancing. And when you're ready uh, and we can sit down and go, okay, let's map this thing out. Although he doesn't map out, I don't know enough about novels and stuff. <laughs> I need to have everything like right in front. So we'll figure this out. And we can do, we can do it that way. And then yeah. if, because it if it takes a turn and doesn't quite follow the map, that'll be okay. I'm at this, always, weird, they this weird stage do. where there's so much I want to do. Uh, you know, people are doing novels in verse, which I love that idea. You know, as so I said, oh, I'll just do a crime novel in mm -hmm. verse and compete with Bruce a little bit more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> who knows? Uh, but yeah, so so some weird hybrid thing is going to happen uh, this year because my my poetry book's all done. I'm not worried about mm -hmm. that. I think it'll be fine, uh, and and we'll we'll create something. I think. Well, I very much look forward yeah. to having you come back to the Marin Poetry Center, hopefully in person, but both of you to talk about what comes of this project. We'll see, or we'll one see. of us may be dead. <laughs> 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 Who knows? Well, thank you so much for this evening. Um, it's oh, really sure, man. It's so good to see lovely. you again. It's amazing. It's, it's, lovely. it's it, this has been amazing. I could talk to you for hours, but I really want you to go have your um, <laughs> anniversary. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks and, all you guys who came. Thanks all my yeah, friends and students and best friends and Ellen. Hi, Ellen <laughs> and Dee Dee, witchy girl. Uh, anyway. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks to our audience and thanks to our wonderful readers tonight. Um, we'll thanks see you so all much. soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.